Okay. Okay. I'd like to call the meeting to order of the Huron Valley Schools uh, regular board meeting on April 13th, 2020. Um, could I have a roll call, Secretary Force? You may. Uh, Mr. Long? Here. Ms. Cotter? I'm here. Okay. Uh, Mr. Carlson? Um, he's here. on another. Oh, okay. He's here. Good. I'm here. Mr. Pearson? Here. And Ms. Pistano. Here. And Mr. Wiseman. Here. Everybody is present. Thank you. Could we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the Republic of the United States, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, approval of agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the agenda? I'll approve the agenda. So, so moved. Okay. Okay, there. Motion made by by Mr. Denise Forrest, seconded by Jim Pearson. Have a roll call, please. Yes. Um, uh, yep. I approve, Mr. Pearson. Yes. Ms. Connor. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. Uh, Mr. Carlson. Oh, he must have had a dash out. Ms. Pistana. Yes. And uh, Mr. Wiseman. Yes. Okay. Recognition. Recognition is suspended until further notice. Items from the superintendent. Dr. Salah. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, good evening to our listening audience. Those of you that are out there watching this virtually, welcome to our second uh, virtual board meeting. I would start my comments by saying uh, I, I always thought that working from home would be much easier than it actually is. You actually work all the time. You don't ever really stop working when you work from home. So I have uh, several updates uh, to share with you uh, this evening as well as our, our listening audience. I want to start with uh, first on the agenda is our COVID-19 updates and there are actually several components that I want to touch on from our phase three learning plan to our food distribution efforts um, to our bond projects uh, and, and so on and so forth. So let me just jump in uh, by talking about our phase three learning plan, our learn at home plan. So, you know, since the closure of schools way back uh, mid-March, March 13th, uh, I, I have just received regular and frequent communications from our, our constituents, from our, our parents uh, regarding, you know, the phase one and phase two, really looking towards when we were going to intensify our loan at our learn at home platform. I've received you know dozens of of emails from families, and so we've continued to communicate with our families regarding our status and our progress. And, and last week, actually not the last week, but the week before, we were pleased to uh, really announce to parents that we were we were just about ready uh, to move into to phase three. And so I'd like to start off just by saying you know I, I want to. Thank our, our TLT department, you know, John Tavernier as our assistant superintendent, our teacher leaders, our principals, uh, all of our Huron Valley teachers for the energy efforts and, and commitment uh, to meet the needs of our students and our families. Uh, you know, we have all been working very hard uh, to, to make sense of this new normal. Uh, and that includes finding creative ways to feed our students and educate our students. And I'm grateful for every member of the Huron Valley team that has stepped up and has just been so gracious in, in working hard to accomplish that effort. And so before the governor formally announced uh, her, her last executive, the, the executive order 
uh, 2020-35, we were really preparing from the beginning for, for what we thought phase three might look like. And, and that involves, you know, more daily activities, regular touch points with our, with our teachers and students and more regular communication from our principals, uh, troubleshooting uh, from our principals and assistant principals, uh, as well as uh, giving parents an opportunity to troubleshoot technology challenges because, you know, as we noticed from the beginning of this call, uh, technology is not always the easiest thing to, to work with. So as we shift into phase three, we just we want to thank our parents in advance uh, for their patience and their feedback and, you know, just recognize that we're, we're kind of taking a slow roll into phase three, recognizing that you know, it's going to take us a little time to figure all of the nuances out. And we're thankful uh, for our parents for being patient as we as we work through that. So uh, I would also add that in no uncertain, no uncertain terms, and I've said this over and over again, the reason why I continue to say it is because I, be, I believe it from the bottom of my heart that there's, there's no substitute for a highly qualified teacher uh, who's engaging with students in classrooms face to face you know, we cannot replicate schools online. Uh, and, and I know some people have said, well, Superintendent Salah, why can't you just shift everything you were doing, you know, prior to, to this mandatory closure to an online platform? It doesn't work. It doesn't work that way, especially not in our, in our youngest grades. Uh, you, you know, teaching elementary school children how to read is not something that you can do behind a, a computer uh, and having, you know, 15 or 25 faces on a screen and, and trying to accomplish that task. It requires significant coordination with families. It requires stamina for our kids to be able to spend that much time behind a, a computer. So so that said, I just, again, I just want to thank our, our entire staff community. I want to thank our teachers for all their hard work to ramp up and our principals and facilitating those conversations. Uh, I also want to thank our parents for their, their continued patience and grace as we as we navigate these unchartered territories. I um, wanted to address briefly as well as it relates to phase three, you know, I've continued to receive uh, a variety of questions from parents and, and seniors, our, our seniors, senior students, our students that are graduating, not, not senior citizens, um, our, our student seniors uh, regarding graduation. Um, and so I, I just wanted to share with those of you that are tuning in specifically uh, looking for additional information regarding that topic. We are working on what, uh, what uh, graduation looks like, uh, what credits look like, what grading looks like. Um, and Mr. Tavernier will be providing a little more detail regarding what that's shaping up into a, a little later in the agenda under, under new business. But I just wanted to share with you, you know, especially to our seniors, you're, you're, you're on our hearts. We're thinking about you constantly, and we are going to figure out a way uh, to honor you, uh, even if that isn't in May. Um, you know, that could be in July. That could be in August. Um, we're, we're going to come up with solutions because seniors, you deserve it. You've worked hard and you deserve to be recognized for all of your hard work. So so hang in there, guys. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get through this. Um, so as we roll into to phase three, um, we will continue to send additional communications. Uh, recently, we posted an FAQ document that's on our website. So I would just encourage our families, if you have not had a chance to visit our website and, and click on the coronavirus tab, there's just a wealth of information there, including all the communications uh, from my office. The FAQ is there. Uh, we have sent that out and updated it over the last couple of weeks. So I would encourage you to revisit uh, the FAQ. We're also in the process of creating a, a snapshot document. I'm just going to share my screen here for a moment so you can get a sense of what it looks like. This is still in draft form, uh, but just, just to give you know the board an idea regarding what some additional communication will look like as well as our families. Um, so I'm going to just present my screen here. Um, this, is, this is hot off the presses, still, still in draft format. And hopefully I can drag this over, otherwise, okay, hang on a second. Speaking of technology. Okay, well, 
doesn't look like I can share it. So I'll have to figure out another way to do this and uh, come back to it. I'm trying to drag it from one screen to the other. So I will come back. Let me see if I can share that in a few minutes in another way. Actually, you know what? I know what I'm doing here. Sorry about this. Okay, let's, let's try this now. Okay, can you see that? I see Denise's head nodding, so yeah, I you can see that. Okay, good, very good. Sorry about that. Thank you for your, thank you for your patience. So, um, this is just a snapshot document. This is designed for parents. We're designing it as part of a larger toolkit. Uh, this is going to be coming primarily out of our communications department, and Kim has been working diligently with, along with Laura Colvin, uh, and and John and myself. Uh, to really try to encapsulate some of the key elements as it relates to phase three as we continue our, our rollout of phase three. Um, and so you'll see, you know, there's we're covering some high level components, you know, what parents can expect from content, communication, compassion, uh, what it should, what it will look like roughly at the elementary level. And it's kind of hard to see this, but you'll see there's a minute designation of what you can expect uh, for students on a daily uh, and a weekly basis at the elementary, the middle, and the high school, as well as what communication schedules and office hours will look like at the elementary, the middle, and the high school. And we plan to add also uh, a piece that speaks specifically to what grading and graduation requirements look like. So as I mentioned, this is very, this is very much in draft form. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on it, um, but I do wanna share with you that we continue to work towards uh, our, our best plans for communicating uh, with our families and preparing them for what phase three looks like. We don't want our parents to stress. We don't want our staff to stress because as I said, this is not the ideal learning environment. So uh, we are all just doing the best that we can to provide what's best for our students. So another piece I would mention under uh, under uh, phase three is our Chromebook distribution. Uh, you, you know, I just have to give incredible uh, kudos to our technology team. They have just done remarkable work over the last two weeks uh, distributing Chromebooks to families that are that are in need. Uh, last time I, I checked with John, we had well over 2,000 responses to our survey that we have distributed in, in two rounds. Uh, in the first round, uh, we distributed 351 Chromebooks to our families. In the second round, we distributed 656 Chromebooks to families. Uh, that's for a total of 1,007 total Chromebooks that have been distributed to date. Um, and the team is already looking at what round three will look like. Uh, we don't believe that we will have uh, the same volume in terms of, of round three, but we do know that there are some families that still do not have access to technology and may have missed uh, the first two surveys that were put out. Um, so we will continue to, to brainstorm regarding how we're going to get Chromebooks in the hands of our families um, and so more to come on that piece. But I would, I would be remiss if I didn't also uh, thank our technology team for the remarkable work they've been doing helping families uh, to troubleshoot technology issues uh, ranging from network challenges all the way to to password issues. It is an incredible, incredible lift. Uh, and so I just can't thank that group enough for the work that they're doing. So I'm gonna shift gears here uh, into the next part of my COVID update, which relates to bond projects. And uh, I wanna share my screen again. Uh, this is hot off the presses and it relates specifically to the last executive order uh, 2020-35. There have been a number of questions regarding 2020-35 uh, and uh, some of the elements associated with it. What I want to touch on uh, for the board this evening is specifically relates uh, to uh, construction projects. And so if, if as I scroll down here, 
and I am going to highlight. It's number three, and I'm highlighting it on my screen. Do you see the blue highlight there? If you could nod your heads or something so I know you're seeing it. Okay, yes. Tom, you're seeing it. Okay, good. So it says, can the district begin or continue school construction projects? And the answer is, in general, no. While some limited forms of construction are permissible under Executive Order 2020-42, stay home, stay safe, or any other order that may follow, school construction projects do not generally qualify under these limited circumstances. However, emergency maintenance and repairs are permitted to restore functionality of district buildings. So, for example, if, you know, we're getting some pretty heavy wind and some inclement weather, if, if that... Uh, caused our power to go down in one of our buildings, that would be considered a emergency maintenance and or repair that would be sanctioned under this uh, under this executive or under this uh, specific uh, executive order as a contingency. So for construction pro projects that have already begun, and we have examples of that in Huron Valley, our bid pack one, our boilers and our chillers, that work already started. That's what this is speaking to. And what it says is, that for, for construction projects that have already begun, workers are not are only permitted to preserve, preserve the current condition of the project, such as putting in place temporary security or weatherization measures. All other in-person work or school construction projects must cease until the restrictions of the order are lifted and normal operations resume. So I, I share that this evening because that is a question that I have had uh, several times, not only from the board, uh, uh, not only from board members, uh, but also I've heard it asked repeatedly uh, from my professional organizations, um, as well as uh, other superintendents in, in, in Oakland County, Wayne County, Macomb counties, uh, you know, because people are eager to get work done uh, in their school districts. So that being said, let me just touch on the three bid packs that currently, or I should say two bid packs that have been approved, and the third one that that uh, there's a bid opening tomorrow, actually. So the chillers and boiler work, that was bid pack one that the board approved. That work started with demo um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the actual chillers themselves. So what they did was they disconnected all the chillers, uh, and they are, they are ready to be removed but they have not been removed at this point because that's when the stay home, stay safe order took place. So everything is on hold uh, as it relates to the chiller and boiler project. Um, bid pack two, which was also approved by the board, uh, is primarily the turf uh, at the stadiums at both Lakeland and Milford High Schools. Those contracts have been submitted. Uh, we have uh, contractors and vendors that are on standby, they're ready to work, and they're actually ready to begin those projects as early as May 4th. If the stay home, stay safe order is lifted, they can actually start that work, and the likelihood of them completing them much earlier than anticipated is very high uh, because school is not in session, and we do not, we do not expect to be back in session until, uh, until the following uh, school year. So, um, so that's the status on bid pack two. As it relates to bid pack three, that's the asphalt at Watkins and Bannerman. Uh, you'll recall we had Consumers Energy at a board meeting not too long ago. They walked through the scope of the Consumers Project. Uh, that project will require them to remove the asphalt of Bannerman as they, as they run the pipeline down that specific uh, road. So this... This project specifically is, is following up on the heels of that consumer's project. The bids are, are due tomorrow, and, and they're set to be open here, uh, I believe, actually, tomorrow. Uh, Jeffrey, can you confirm that? Bids are set to be open tomorrow? Uh, yes, Dr. Salas. So much like the uh, board meeting that we're in right now, we will have a virtual bid opening uh, where our vendors have the ability to hear uh, the public bids being read uh, as they come in. So much like we would in a normal uh, bid opening, uh, we're doing it now virtually with a with with password uh, protected meeting, and uh, we'll see how that goes. Thank you, Jeffrey. 
See how you see how well Jeffrey was paying attention. He jumped right on that when I asked that question. Nice job, Jeffrey. <laughs> um, the the next bid pack is bid pack four. Uh, we we plan to take that to the finance and operations uh, uh, subcommittee for additional conversations. Unfortunately, given uh, given this this closure, it is it is causing some issues as it relates to bid pack four. So we will need to get some additional. Uh, communication and uh, collaboration and feedback from the finance and, and operations committee uh, regarding some of the work that was designated for for a uh, bid pack four. So that that specifically is my second part of the COVID update, which relates to, to bond projects. The third component I want to touch on is food service. And this is this is obviously a topic that is near and dear to I know many of the hearts of our board members is, is, as it is uh, the co team and myself. I, you know, you've heard me share in the past 30% of our students qualify for free and reduced lunch. And it's absolutely paramount that we continue to, to feed our students that depend on, on the schools for, for meals throughout this, the school year. Um, we did, we did uh, feed students last week uh, during spring break as well. We had several staff uh, working. And, and again, I, I just want to thank our food service uh, team, our transportation department and and all the volunteers that have stepped up to, to pack lunches and, and distribute uh, food, um, and frankly, at, at their own risk. Um, uh, we are incredibly indebted to them and, and grateful for their service. Um, last week, last week alone, our team distributed 13,893 meals. That's the highest number uh, since we have started. Uh, on Saturday alone, uh, they distributed they distributed 4,200 uh, meals, and so I, I feel very good about that. As do I, do I, I know Jeffrey feels really good about that as as the leader of that work. Uh, you know, many of our children depend upon us for, for food, and I, I was glad that they had food on on Easter. Um, so total to date, uh, 52,160 meals uh, have been distributed uh, by the Huron Valley Schools uh, to to our to our families. Uh, my third update under under COVID deals specifically with with board members, and this is for our, our listening audience. This is you know th these virtual meetings are again just like you know the education we provide to our students. Face to face is best, uh, and I, and I know that our preference as a school district, and and you know I feel pretty confident in saying this. I don't want to speak for the board, but I, I feel pretty confident in saying they prefer having face to face meetings. Uh, but unfortunately, in the interim, we will we will have to continue with these virtual meetings until the shelter in place is lifted. And I know that there is some very important uh, business uh, that relates to the day to day operation of schools that must continue. Uh, and so I, I know we'll continue to work work through that. But we will continue to offer this virtual format. Uh, we will continue to post on our website. Uh, we, we are. We are we're taking an additional step. Obviously, we're not posting just in our buildings because uh, nobody is visiting our buildings right now. So we're posting uh, board agendas on the Huron Valley Schools website. Um, it's it's being posted specifically under uh, one of the news bullets. So once it's posted, it's popped up at the top. Uh, and today I noticed when I clicked on the Huron Valley's website, an alert came up that said uh, for access to the board agenda, click here. So it's prompting it's prompting our our community to gain access to the board agenda, and through the board agenda, community members can can provide a public comment. They can call in and provide public comment, and they can also access the YouTube live live stream in order to view the meetings live while they are while they are ongoing. Um, so. Last, as it relates to COVID specifically, I do have a couple of other items. Uh, I, I, the, the question was asked of me, actually, Mr. Wiseman asked me this question about uh, the International Academy West. And I think it's important to note that you know, we, are, we serve as the fiscal agent uh, and the fiscal agents collaborate regarding supports as it relates to the International Academy West. But they do operate as, as a separate school district with their own school code designation. So as we are submitting our continuity of learning plans as a Huron Valley School District, the IA is required by law to also submit 
a continuity of learning plan. Now, that being said, uh, my colleagues from Troy, uh, as well as uh, as well as uh, Bloomfield Hills, uh, is working with uh, the the administration at the IA to provide guidance and support regarding graduation requirements, uh, as well as credits and grading. Um, so uh, you'll learn more about our plan as it relates to those items uh, this evening. Uh, but I felt it was important to share with you uh, because. Although the, we are the, the fiscal agent, we, we view the IA West students as our students uh, and we want to take care of them and we want to make certain uh, that their educational experiences are not interrupted through this entire uh, crisis situation. So I'm going to shift away from COVID-19 updates. Uh, I, I want to take a moment uh, and first off, I want to congratulate uh, Jim Pearson. Um, I actually meant to do this at our last virtual board meeting, and I preferred to do it uh, when we were all in the same room. But I learned uh, just before the COVID crisis that uh, Mr. Pearson uh, earned his level one certification and award of merit through the Michigan Association of School Boards. Um, you know, being a school board member is a tremendous, uh, is a tremendous uh, uh, time uh, uh, commitment. Uh, and our board members, uh, commit their time because they care about their community and they care about the students that we serve. And so, uh, Jim, I just wanted to congratulate you uh, on your accomplishment. It takes several hours of, of class instruction in order to earn those types of distinctions. So, so congratulations, Jim, on, on that honor. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And, and the last, the last thing uh, that I wanted to mention under my comments, uh, Mr. President, uh, I wanted to take a moment and just uh, recognize uh, Dawn Cruz. Uh, many of you know that Dawn uh, has accepted uh, another position uh, with Oakland Schools. Uh, I can't say that I was surprised that she was offered the position. She's an absolutely outstanding uh, leader and employee and Huron Valley Schools is truly going to be at a deficit with, with her leaving. Uh, here, Dawn has, has served Huron Valley students and families and staff uh, for 33 years. Um, and I know that I speak for the entire uh, student, student and staff body when I say, Dawn, you will be missed. Uh, we thank you for your service. We thank you for your leadership. Uh, we thank you for your incredible uh, gifts and your sense of humor. And uh, I hope you don't. I hope you don't become a stranger. In fact, I, I know you won't become a stranger. Um, but but I just wanted to wish you well because I know your last day is is April seventeenth. So um, so, Mr. President, that concludes my comments, and thank you very much. Thank you, um, Jim Pearson. Do you have any questions as it relates to uh, the, our superintendent's comments? I, I just wanted to add that Don Cruz is a Milford High graduate. And one of us is her former teacher, but she's always <laughs> outstanding. Great. Denise Forrest? Nope. All right. Uh, Denise Pistana? Uh, no. Uh, yeah, thank you for the information about uh, food service, uh, 52,000 meals. That's excellent. And uh, my congratulations also to Don Cruz. Jeff? Just want to say congratulations to Don. He'll be missed. I'm certainly going to miss all your technical help. Lindsay. Did we lose Lindsay? Sean, do you have any comments? I got the volume. Hold on. All right, super. A couple of things. Paul was right on with a number of his comments regarding uh, what's going on in the district. Uh, I was happy to hear about our Chromebook distribution um, and the work that's going on. I too am working on a Chromebook tonight. It makes it much easier. Um, I've been helping out with our food service department with blessings in a backpack, but those people, the volunteers are doing a wonderful job. And congratulations to Jim, level one, that's good. And I knew Dawn Cruz years ago because she was a Baker parent. 
and she has continued to serve Huron Valley Schools with the utmost, um, how do I say that? Uh, she has been a wonderful worker in this position and a very supportive parent, likewise an employee and has kept us up to date on everything. So Paul, thank you for your comments. I've made many uh, notes here tonight. Um, I appreciate everything that you uh, commented on. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Mr. Carlson? He might be off right now. Um, I too wanna thank uh, Paul for bringing us up to speed on, on a number of items. And I, I certainly appreciate your comments and as it relates to uh, the IA West. And uh, if you would continue to keep us posted as it relates to the, uh, the continuity of, uh, of learning that's being put in place for our students at IA West. Uh, I think the other thing that I would like to comment about, and I wasn't sure exactly where, where I should comment and uh, ask for uh, input, but um, you're absolutely right, uh, Paul, as it relates to the, our preferred uh, setting, it would be over at Milford High School or at Lakeland High School as it relates to these board meetings. And uh, we embrace uh, the spirit of transparency and openness and, and uh, uh, welcome our, our community as it relates to face-to-face -face comments. And you're absolutely right too that we have a number of issues that uh, and challenges that are before us, and we've had to kind of, we've had to move to virtual meetings as opposed to face to face meetings. And originally, uh, one of the items that we talked about in great detail was the direction that uh, we needed to go as it relates to our uh, our leisure pools and the issues that we're facing with that. And uh, we know that um, one of the things that we we've, we've done is had a lot of discussions, and in prior and just prior to us uh, uh, the new normal, we had a uh, a town hall meeting that was well attended. Uh, our our administration did a great job as it relates to not only presenting but answering any of the questions that they had. And uh, on March twentieth, uh, there was correspondence to our community from our superintendent. Uh, stating that uh, uh, at our last board meeting that we would not have any uh, discussion or action as it relates to the direction and the school's direction as it relates to leisure pools and that we wanted to make it known to any community members that this would that we would like to be heard like to hear from them and have them ha have that opportunity to address the board during a typical in-person meeting if at all possible unfortunately my belief and it was discussed at the executive board and um, the executive board also concurred that we need to move forward with this. So with that being said, um, I would like to uh, move forward that at the next board meeting, I would ask the superintendent to bring his team together to not only bring us back to speed on all the various conversations that we've had with our community, uh, the various questions that we've had, the answers that we've given, and any other open-ended items that we might have as, as it relates to the leisure pools. And I would also ask the administration then to uh, provide to us as a Board of Education their recommendation as it pertains to the leisure pools. On May 4th, um, we would have open dialogue with that as it relates to that. And also on, and then from a timeline standpoint, work towards a resolution based on the recommendation uh, from our administration. I would also ask if, if the board concurs with that timeline that uh, Paul and his staff uh, provide the, uh, the wherewithal to communicate this process to our community so that they have that opportunity to uh, ask any additional questions of the administration and as we've done in the past and also uh, have them informed that uh, we will be having uh, board dialogue on May 4th and May 18th as it relates to that. So with that being said, um, um, could I have uh, some comments or uh, consent as it relates to what I've just talked about?
Does anybody have any comments with that? No, I just, uh, Forrest here. Um, I appreciate you bringing it up now. Uh, you know, we expected to continue this conversation at our open in-person board meetings. And like you said, this is not the ideal uh, circumstance to present uh, something as big as that. But I'm hoping that on May 4th, uh, uh, Dr. Salah, you know, presents his findings. I know he's talked to uh, lots of folks, both um, community members and um, civic leaders, our municipality leaders, and then he'll bring bring that to the table on May 4th. Um, and we specifically, you know, during the beginning of this COVID uh, crisis, we did not want to endanger um, anyone, especially senior citizens and in having um, uh, public face-to-face -face meetings, which we could have had on um, in the beginning of March on the 16th, I believe. And it was much better to to go uh, virtual at that point. Um, and that was the right decision. And so I know you're going to invite folks to for comments. Um, most likely it'll be digital on May 4th and who knows on, on May 18th. But I look forward to hearing what Dr. Salah has to say and what our community members has to say, both on the 4th and the 18th. Thank you for bringing that up. Thank you. Any other comments? With that being said, uh, if there are no more comments, uh, if you would, Dr. Salah, be have yourself along with administration be ready to move forward so that we can get the information that we need as it relates to making a decision as it relates to uh, the leisure pools. Yep, certainly, certainly happy to do that, Mr. Wiseman. Um, we will uh, we will begin preparing for for May fourth. Uh, provide an overview and, and certainly incorporate some of the thinking and questions that we heard from the community during the informational meeting uh, uh, on March 9th. Um, also, uh, Mr. Wiseman, given the, the unusual circumstances, I know how important transparency is. Uh, you know, I will work with uh, with Kim's office to to draft a communication to the community so that so that they know uh, we have every intention to bring this topic up on May 4th. That provides uh, plenty of time for uh, those in the community that are, are interested uh, to make appropriate arrangements to connect uh, vir virtually uh, and or prepare any questions or, or comments that they may have. Um, okay. I, I do have one other item, Mr. President, whenever you're ready. Yes. Go ahead, please. Uh, the first and second quarter budget amendments. Yes, yes. I, I wanted to just take a moment before I turn it, before I turn this over to, to Jeffrey. I just want to thank the the business office, uh, in, including uh, Michelle for all their work. Uh, it, it takes an extraordinary amount of time and energy to to really uh, engage in in these uh, amendments, and so I, I'm appreciative of of that department for their work and for Jeffrey's uh, leadership to make that happen. Um, I would also add. Uh, you know, we had this on the agenda prior to COVID, um, and I don't think it's going to be a shock to anybody when I say uh, the financial circumstances that face our state right now are completely different than what they were just a few months ago. Um, I, I was on a call this morning uh, where the Senate Majority Leader Shirky was on the call, and the question was asked: Could could school districts be faced with potential uh, with potential per pupil cuts as early as this year, this current fiscal year? Um, and, and he said anything basically is possible, and that he did not know the answer uh, to that as we sit here today. Um, so. Uh, I would just I would just say that you know we're going Jeffrey's going to walk through the first and second quarter budget amendments uh, adjustments rather, um, but the the financial future uh, is is uh, ex looks extraordinarily challenging uh, at least for the next year. Uh, even more important, uh, why uh, we need to have some additional conversations regarding uh, the leisure pool operation. So with that said, uh, uh, Jeffrey, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you uh, to, to walk through the presentation. 
Thank you again, Dr. Slav, for that. I'm going to present my screen now. What we've done as a presentation uh, for the viewing community. This has been something that was, again, addressed at our Finance and Operations Committee meeting probably about a month ago and received uh, committee approval. Uh, this is now coming to the board for full board approval in this uh, board meeting this evening. So what we have here is the uh, fiscal year 1920 first and second quarter budget adjustments. We're going to go back to our revised budget after our fiscal year 1819 audit results. So uh, what we have for you here is the 1718 and 1819 audited uh, financial results for our general fund. And as you can see in 1718, we uh, lost uh, 1.4 million or had 1.4 million more in expenditures than revenues. Uh, we were able to improve that for the 1819 year, uh, showing $800,000 in expenditures over revenue. Uh, for the 1920 year, uh, before these adjustments, we were showing a $400,000 uh, expenditures over revenue. And then for the 2021 year, we were projecting a slight increase of about $200,000 in revenue over expenditures. Hey, Jeffrey. Yes, sir. Are you, are you sharing your screen? I don't see it. Yes, I was sharing my screen. Are you not able to see that? Yeah, I'm not seeing it. John's not seeing it either. Is I it? can't Is... see it either. Okay. It's got to be in front. It's got to be the first tab and that's open in front. Um, Is that better now? Are you able to see it? I don't see it. Nope. On the lower right of the same place where you turn the mic on and off. Present now. So Jeffrey, I think I have it. I'll share my screen and you can talk us through it. Okay. Okay. Yep. Wonderful. So if we could go down to the next page, John, that's kind of what I was explaining when everybody was looking at a blank screen. So we have before you 1.4 million in expenditures over revenue, uh, $800,000 for 1819, uh, $400,000 for 1920, and then a slight increase in 2021 uh, as, as budgeted. If you could move to the next screen for me, John. So for the general fund, this is what makes up our revenue adjustments from our original budget that was passed in June through uh, the end of the second quarter, which is really December 31st. Uh, we have transferred our early childhood program from community and recreation education to our instructional department. So this is what we would consider our annual revenues in uh, early childhood being brought into the general fund. Uh, we were able to increase our property tax revenue from our estimates by about $165,000. Uh, we had an increase in funding as a result of uh, additional students from our initial pupil loss estimate, uh, and that generated about $373,000. We did receive an additional $40 this year from the state of Michigan in our per pupil funding, uh, which was again about another $350,000. Uh, we had some shift from local property tax to state aid for about $300,000. Uh, we did increase $22,000 roughly in special ed revenue from our initial estimate and in state aid. And we had a decrease in our PA 18 special ed millage as a result of our uh, allocation formula from Oakland County uh, for about $600,000. Uh, we did have one-time adjustments of the consumer energy proceeds from our pipeline of 766 and our proceeds from sale of vacant land for 520 bringing us to a adjusted general fund budget of just a little over 93 million. 
the next slide shows us our expenditure adjustments. Again, we we are showing uh, ninety point one million dollars as our initial amount from our original budget. Uh, we have some uh, recurring adjustments, including our increase in local source expenditure, essentially the expenses associated with our early childhood revenue that we just mentioned. Uh, some increase in transportation costs for twenty five hundred dollars. We did have some additional positions, mostly as a uh, driven by additional pupil count, uh, some special ed positions, and then a maintenance and operations addition. Uh, we did have a retirement rate increase of 0.78% district wide. Uh, so those are the figures there associated with that, about $425,000. Uh, One time adjustments in per capita carryover for about $156,000. Uh, we did have an MO truck purchase that uh, was budgeted for in the 18 19 year that actually came through in the 1920. Uh, some other de minimis or miscellaneous increases for $10,000, and then a fund transfer to community and rec edu recreation education to help offset that structural deficit that exists in community and rec ed uh, for a new total of a uh, little over uh, $93.3 million in expenditures for the year. So immediately after our second quarter, first and second quarter adjustments, you can see that we're uh, basically right in line with our original budget of about $400,000 in expenditures over revenue. Uh, I can tell you as a result of even the uh, comments that Dr. Slaw had mentioned, uh, there is some uncertainty with the rest of the year as far as uh, state aid that will be received, uh, as well as uh, expenditures that will be going out over the next several months. Uh, we are taking a look at that and we hope to have a finance committee meeting here in the next uh, week or 10 days or so. And we'll address uh, some of our other uh, challenges that may come up as a result of uh, the uncertainty surrounding the rest of the year. Uh, and that will also impact the 2021 school year as well. Uh, so again, information changes uh, almost on the daily for us uh, from an administrative standpoint. So uh, we will continue to keep the uh, Board of Education as well as the community aware of any changes that uh, come before us. You can move to the next slide for me, Mr. Travernier. We also wanted to talk a little bit about recreation and community education. Uh, so we did end our, our fiscal year 63019 with an accumulated deficit and that special revenue fund of $1.6 million. Uh, based on last year's estimate uh, with our actual loss between four fifty dollars and $500,000, uh, we can guesstimate that uh, a worst case scenario would be that we would have a loss similar to last year. Uh, we did budget uh, $370,000 between um, an offset of operating costs coupled with a long-term debt pay down essentially or a reduction in our uh, fund balance deficit. Uh, we are moving $750,000 over as a result of uh, the consumer's energy and sale of vacant land, taking some of those monies over. Uh, and then we're going to uh, make $200,000, I'm sorry, special revenue Interfund transfers uh, to uh, the end goal being that we would re significantly reduce our uh, structural deficit and our fund balance deficit in rec and community education uh, for the 630 20 year. Uh, unfortunately, uh, just like with our general operations, we uh, are now not having anybody enter our community and rec ed programs as a result of our stay home, stay safe order. Uh, so that will impact. Uh, what we're presenting here to you tonight. Uh, and again, our Finance and Operations Committee will need to take a look at all of our special revenue accounts uh, and have that further dialogue at another meeting uh, to properly determine uh, next steps as we deal with uh, not only community and recreation education, but also uh, food service and International Academy West. <clears throat> that was it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Travernier, for presenting the uh, PowerPoint. I don't know what happened with my present screen. I do apologize for that inconvenience. Uh, and I'm available, obviously, for questions or comments. All right. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. Um, Denise Forrest, do you have any questions for Jeffrey? Um, just a uh, $787,000 uh, deficit. Is that, again, from uh, Community Rec and Ed that we're going to be expecting next year? Or what is that? from totally so if we anticipate the year that we think we will have in community and recreation education as it stood this year our deficit was 1.6 million dollars accumulated 
it'll be down to seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars uh by the end of this year and then we will have to talk about future years uh what it will take to uh eliminate that accumulated deficit so that's um just so i understand it so that would be the accumulating deficit beginning uh, and 630 20 going into next year, and then whenever happens going forward with that uh, community record, then it would be added to or subtracted from that amount of money. Correct. Right. It's only there to incur expenses uh, or get revenues. Okay. Thank you. Also, the PA uh, 18, I bet it was explained before, but. Uh, I'm not sure the uh, special education uh, money, the 600,000. So the allocation was less. Yeah. So it was less than we had uh, budgeted for. Uh, and so this is just a correction to our budget to account for that difference. Okay. Thank you. That's it from me. Right. Denise Pistana. Uh, no questions at this time. Thank you. All right. Mr. Long. No, nope, nothing at this time. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was very informative. Ms. Kyder? No, I'm good to go. I reviewed everything, and uh, Jeffrey did a good job of presenting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carlson, be available. And Mr. Pearson? Um, looks... Fully understandable and considerably grim. If uh, something isn't done to fix it, then the state certainly isn't going to be in a position to probably help us a lot in the coming year or two. So it is what it is. Yeah. Thank you, Jim. Um, Jeffrey, I do have a couple comments or questions. Uh, first, first comment. Thank you, and thank you for the the staff for putting this together. I think it's it's very 7-Eleven and uh, I appreciate the, the transparency as it relates to this presentation. And obviously, uh, third and fourth quarter are, are going to present some significant challenges. But on your slide, uh, I think it's page five, the uh, 1920 budget after first and second quarter adjustments. Can you bring that back up as possible? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Um, I, couple, whoops. I think it's interesting to note one of the challenges that we've had is really that structural deficit. In 1819, we showed about what a eight hundred thousand dollar structural deficit, correct? Yes, sir. But even prior to that, off the top of your head, do you know what the 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 low point was as it relates to that structural deficit approximately? Yeah, so the, the fiscal year 16, 17 was over $3 million, 3.1. Okay, so since that time, 16, 17, we had a $3.1 million structural deficit that, that with this projection, and obviously there's the unknowns, and, and as Mr. Pearson said, it looks pretty grim. You were projecting next year for us as a school district to be totally out of that structural deficit and actually have a operation, operating surplus even though it's a small amount. That is correct. Okay, well, I think I think we're certainly heading in the right direction. Unfortunately, some of the variables are not in our favor. The, the other piece um, that, uh, that I wanna point out is our fund balance. Our fund balance is extraordinarily low. It's, you know, it's right there in the middle, 5%. And I think it's also important to note that highlight down below that anything less than 5%, we fall into that Department of Treasury early warning legislation. So we don't have a, we don't have a whole lot of wiggle room. And we also know the, the, the challenge that we've been facing as it relates to the special revenue fund, specifically community rec, that's really a general fund obligation. So if we took that special revenue fund deficit and combined it with the general fund balance, our general fund balance would be approximately what three and a half percent. Yeah, so we would we would basically if we uh, end out the year like we just showed on our slide, Tom, coupled with uh, this dollar amount here, we would be 
uh, at about three point three uh, million dollars, which would put us at anywhere between the uh, uh, high threes to four or four and a half percent on the fund balance side. So yeah, very below five percent is the point mm -hmm. that needs to be hit home. And and we know uh, that we we received that correspondence a while back from Treasury regarding our bonds and whether our bonds were going to be qualified or not qualified because of that deficit in the special revenue fund. That's correct. So at which, first that, go ahead. I'm sorry, which if that had happened, the, the, the great interest rate that we had when you just, your, you and your staff just sold that, those bonds, I, it would be fair to say that that interest rate would have been higher and would have ultimately cost our taxpayers additional dollars from a, from an interest standpoint. Yes, because there was such a substantial savings as a result of the work that uh, the entire team uh, performed, uh, you could you could estimate that that would have been in the millions, Tom, as far as additional monies. Yeah, exactly. Well, congratulations, great job. And then the, the, the final piece that I think it's worthwhile to point out, in your uh, projected budget 2021, do you have you have a what a hundred dollar increase in foundation allowance within yep. that direction? Correct. That is correct. That's correct. And do you also have a, a factor in there as it relates to declining enrollment? Yes, I, I think we have it in there now at uh, between one and two hundred students as well. Okay. Okay. All right. So again, things things that for the community or viewing audience uh, may change within the next week or month or you know two months we're, we're real hopeful that uh, the state of Michigan will come through this uh, and that we will be you know held harmless as it relates to additional monies going forward but um, just keep our fingers crossed and uh, keep ahead of uh, what's going to come up in the next several months Super. well once again thank you for the presentation uh, it's very clear where we're at and while well, it's very unclear where we're going to end up so I'm sure we're going to have a lot of conversations between now and in June 30th because we have to have a balanced budget. The state has to have a balanced budget. Um, Hi, Tom. It's Lindsay. Could I jump in? Yes, Lindsay, go ahead. I just want to thank you for your comments regarding to the public regarding our fund balance and what is going on now and what will be going on in the future. Likewise, I want to thank Jeffrey um, for his report tonight. I think everything was right on. So thank you to you both. It may, certainly made some of these budget issues very clear. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments as it relates to Jeffrey in his staff's presentation tonight? Okay, Paul, any, any other items from the superintendent? No, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, next, we have items from, from the board. I just have one item. It's a, a communication that I sent out uh, April 1st regarding the Oakland Schools Board of Education election 2020. Um, our, our job uh, coming up in May, which will be occurring at the May 18th board meeting, we'll need to pass a resolution designating a representative to vote in the election on behalf of the board. We need to direct to designate which candidate uh, we would like to uh, vote as a, a member of the Oakland County School Board, Board of Education, which one we would support, and to direct the, whoever that designee is to vote for that individual so supported by our district. I bring that up twofold. Number one, um, the, uh, if anyone is interested or anyone in the community is interested in uh, being a candidate for the five member board at the Oakland Schools Board of Education. You have until May 1st to submit that application. And number two, uh, I, I requested from our board members if anyone would like to be that uh, representative to represent the board at that election. Nobody, nobody, uh, my phone wasn't ringing off the hook. So uh, if that's all right with you, I, I'll uh, go ahead and take that position and be that designee to vote on our behalf. And that, that will be part of that resolution on uh, May 18th. Um, we will not know who those candidates are until May 4th. So I will pass, if we do not receive that information prior to the May 4th board meeting or on that date, 
I'll make certain I communicate all that information to you so that we're prepared to make a decision on May 18th. Uh, Vice President Pastana. Congratulations, Mr. Wiseman, on being her designee. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, I've said this before, but I'll continue to say it. I want to thank um, everybody from COAT, uh, transportation. I'm going to leave somebody out, but um, everybody, food service, for all that they have been doing. These, this has certainly been an extraordinary time, and uh, I'm so appreciative of everybody giving their all. And uh, so I just want to thank. Thank you, Mrs. Pisana. Treasurer Carlson. All right, Secretary Forrest. Uh, ditto. These are unprecedented times, and I think uh, the staff, uh, board members, volunteers, you've stepped up to the plate. That's really what makes uh, America roll is people who step up during these trying times. And I think that here in Valley School District has done an overall exemplary exemplary job. Uh, it's not easy, as Dr. Salah said, teaching students remotely. Uh, there's a reason uh, kids and teachers are in, in physical school buildings uh, for 10 months out of the year. And I really pray that come September, we are right back at it, uh, regardless of, um, you know, uh, funding from the state. I really hope that um, state and federal government step up uh, so we can continue doing the great things that we do uh, in here in Valley Schools and across Michigan to teach uh, our kids who's really our future. So great job, everybody. Thank you as a uh, board you. member. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Uh, member Pearson, any items? Um, I, I would especially like to uh, congratulate and thank the uh, employees of Heron Valley Schools and the community for what they're doing to uh, keep moving forward with educating kids and keeping the community together. And thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mr. Long. I'd just like to echo the sentiments of the rest of the board. Yes, thank you to the community. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to the administration. I know it's been a difficult time, but everybody's making the right choices and uh, we're seeing light at the end of the tunnel. So be safe and uh, stay home for a little while. Thank you, Member Long. Uh, Ms. Cotter. I'm here. I can only support what my other board members have said. Uh, this community is doing a wonderful job. Likewise, um, all of those secretaries and support staff who are receiving salaries, I just want the people to know that they are the ones that are packing lunches every day and getting food out to our students. So to the whole Huron Valley family, I really thank what they're doing. Uh, this isn't a cheap ride for anybody. Uh, there are costs involved. And I, I just want to thank our staff and thank the people who have, we've been working with. Thank you so much. Thank you. I too want to say thank you. I, you really can tell the, the strength of an organization when things become tough. And uh, we are here on Valley Strong and, and the settlements of the, the rest of the board, I totally concur and support. And also want to say thank you to everyone from our our employees, to our community. And I am so impressed with our students. And I think that's a, a direct reflection of our, our parents, our involvement of our parents, our grandparents, and uncles and aunts and friends, and how involved our teachers are. So shout out to our, shout out to our students because I think they're doing a, a great job. And uh, these, are, these are times that you'll always remember. So thank you very much. Next, student leadership. I don't believe we have any students online. I do. Uh, next item is associate com association comments. I, I saw that Trish was online. Trish, do you have any comments that you'd like to share? I do. Thank you. Thank you. As many of you know, my name is Trisha Rayner, and I am here this evening representing the Huron Valley Education Association. And I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge
acknowledge the dedication of our Huron Valley educators. From our teacher leaders, to our social workers, to our classroom teachers, and everyone in between, I continue to be inspired and in awe of our HVEA members. Immediately after the phase three learning plan was rolled out in typical fashion, our educators got to work. They jumped into high gear to learn the plan and transform teaching and learning into a digital platform that is both meaningful and manageable for our students and their families. Something like this does not happen overnight. And with the rollout happening the day just before spring break, this meant that our educators once again put their students above themselves and spent the week planning and preparing. They met with their PLC team multiple times to narrow down the essential learnings that were left for the remainder of the year to determine a modified scope and sequence. They completed and submitted weekly learning plans. Educators organized student website logins. They went back into their buildings to gather their teaching materials. Tech support was provided for students and their parents. Teachers recorded videos to support students with distance learning. They prepped, they planned, they organized lessons. They created virtual classrooms in their basements and in their spare bedrooms. They coordinated IEP meetings. Much of their break was spent researching and learning about how to keep our students safe and protected during video conferencing. Hours were spent planning for how students' accommodations would be met in this new learning environment because it is important to us that even remotely that we continue to live our mission statement too. Educators by nature are giving, dedicated, and selfless. And tonight, their hard work and their dedication deserves to be acknowledged and honored. Much like when we go to see a play, we can just sit back and enjoy the show but we will never truly be able to grasp the full extent of the hours upon hours that were put in behind the scenes to be prepared for the final performance. Teaching is an art, and what our educators did this last week can be equated to performers preparing for a play. I know not everyone will be able to see all of their preparation and commitment, but it will be evidenced by the learning opportunities that our students will be participating in this week and the connections they will continue to feel with their teachers their school, and this district. So to all of our hardworking educators, I know how hard you worked behind the scenes. I see you, I appreciate you, and I know that without you, none of this is possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Trish. Appreciate your comments. Next, public comments, agenda items only. John, do we have any public comments? No public comments this evening. Thank you. Report from board committees, exec. Uh, the executive committee met on Tuesday, March 31st, 2020 at 5.30 p.m. The place was virtual. In attendance were myself along with Ms. Pistana, Mr. Long, and Dr. Salah. There were no public comments. The agenda consisted of technology and pupil services leadership. With the resignation of Ms. Dawn Cruz, the district will need to take a look at uh, and employ an interim plan to support technology and pupil services. Uh, Mr. Trevernier provided an update to the executive committee regarding that interim plan. We also discussed tonight's board meeting in draft form. We also had a discussion regarding the COVID-19 updates pertaining to phase three, uh, discussed the Oakland County Board of Elections, and we had a discussion regarding board quorums uh, as it related to Michigan Association School Board guidance. And in addition to that, the exec committee discussed the timeline for revisiting the leisure pool operations as discussed earlier, as a follow-up to the community information meeting that was held on March 9th at Oakland, Oak Valley Middle School. The committee discussed its desire to bring the leisure pool discussion to the April 13th meeting if the governor lifts the shelter in place order. Should that that should the governor extend the shelter in place, the committee recommended that the administration bring the agenda item during the May meetings. The executive committee also discussed that a budget must be adopted by June 30th and future decisions will need, be, need to be made in the near future. And our next meeting will be uh, next, uh, next Tuesday, April 28th. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Um, next is TLT update, Mrs. Forrest. 
Sure. I have uh, lots of TLT updates that I'm going to encapsulate in a minute or less, perhaps. Uh, first of all, a shout out to Mr. Tavernier over there um, for being a really excellent juggler because uh, since our schools um, shut down and then shut down uh, for the rest of the school year, he's done really a yeoman's job in getting his team teaching, learning, and technology together uh, to meet uh, to meet this task. And, um, you know, under his leadership, uh, things, um, educational plan, technology, technology for kids that, uh, you know, don't have uh, the technology, all that is being um, understood and taken care of. So we've, uh, it's been very busy. So we've had two meetings. We had a meeting on April 2nd. Um, myself, uh, Ms. Pastana, Mr. Carlson, and the TLT team um, were in attendance for that one. It just happened to coincide with um, uh, the day that um, Governor Whitmer gave her executive order to shut down the schools for the rest of the year. So it was pretty timely. Uh, TLT team discussed that order and um, talked about rolling out phase three with all the procedures that were involved and the Chromebook uh, purchases um, that we discussed. Um, I'm kind of paraphrasing, I know it's a Chromebook distribution that we talked about this evening and discussed uh, adjusting the technology use there to include video conferencing. Uh, so that's in place. Um, and there's a couple other things on tonight's consent agenda also uh, concerning that. So there was a lot discussed and a lot of ideas thrown back and forth that are now pretty much in fruition and, and were rolled out uh, today with the help of, as Ms. Rayner said, um, teachers uh, working tirelessly over their break to make this happen. And then uh, uh, TLT met again with board members, Pistana, Carlson, and myself, and um, Dr. Salon, the TLT team. We met uh, to discuss uh, the rollout as, of the phase three plan, uh, discussing board policy 5127, which we'll be discussing tonight, and again, 6175, the technology acceptable use. And then we also discussed uh, at length, uh, Mr. Tavernier presented the, the grading platform um, because there were questions about, especially um, um, the third uh, marking period that had three weeks to go in it when school was shut down and then what to do with the fourth marking period, the nine weeks that will lead us to the end of the school year. So. You know, that was a heavy lift, but I think um, we came to some good decisions, and I know that um, Ms. Rayner and the, and the um, teacher leaders were there to kind of put their stamp of approval, and that's going to be um, presented uh, this evening in a resolution to pass that. So that is uh, my report, and we do not at this point have a meeting scheduled, um, but I'm sure that we will soon for our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions? Finance and operations. Uh, we did not have a meeting uh, since the last time we had a board of uh, a board meeting. But uh, Jeffrey, uh, the next scheduled uh, meeting date is scheduled for when? So the next uh, meeting is scheduled for uh, I believe a week from this Friday. I had uh, sent some correspondence. It, it might be. Uh, a benefit for us to meet at the end of this week, maybe Friday. So um, we will make sure that the community is aware of any changes to that plan. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, marketing and communications. Uh, yep. Marketing and communications. Uh, we met virtually on Friday, April 3rd at 11 a.m. Present were myself. Mr. Pearson, Ms. Cotter, Dr. Salah, Ms. Root, and Ms. Colvin. There was no public comment. A uh, meeting was held via Google Hangouts. Uh, no pub. Oh, sorry, I already said that. No public COVID nineteen communications. Ms. Root reviewed the communications to staff 
and families, board members commented on the timeliness and comprehensiveness of the communications. She recommended that board members see the district's website where communications would be posted routinely. She also updated the board on the Friday forum that will resume publication on April 17th. We also discussed um, school security grants. Ms. Rip informed us that uh, two grant applications were to be submitted in April related to school security. One is supported by state funding, the other was federal funding. And our next meeting is uh, scheduled for May 1st. That's it. Thank you very much. Any questions? All right, legislative advocacy, Mr. Pearson. Uh, I don't think we have anything to report. It's a few, there's a few distractions in Lansing these days. Yeah, thank you, that's for sure. Okay, consent agenda. Uh, we have exhibits A1 through A6. Do I have a motion to approve the consent uh, agenda items as listed? I will motion to approve the consent agenda items as listed. All right, thank Support. you. Do I need a second? All right. Uh, motion by D Member Pathana, seconded by Member Long. Uh, could I have a roll call, please? Yes, you may, Ms. Pathana. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. Mr. Carlson? Or not, uh, Mr. Pearson? Yes. I'm a yes, Ms. Cotter? Yes. And Mr. Wiseman? Yes. Motion carries. There is no unfinished business. Let's move on to new business, graduation requirements, board resolution. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Salah. Thank you, Mr. President. So as I mentioned earlier, in our com in our uh, our meeting here, that uh, Executive Order 2020-35 uh, requires school districts to adopt to adopt continu continuity of learning plans, and it also it also requires a variety of expectations as it relates to what those plans will consist of, uh, as well as uh, dealing with uh, our graduating seniors. Uh, as you know, uh, there there is board policy that governs the way with which uh, we re we require students uh, to engage in coursework so that they can earn uh, credits and, and graduate on time. Um, so before we actually ask the board uh, to adopt a resolution waiving those graduation requirements, I'm going to ask Mr. Tavernier if he would just take just a few minutes because there has been such an enormous a body of work that has been ongoing as it relates to the, the continuity of learning plans, graduation requirements, grading credits. It's all very complex uh, and is, has just taken an extraordinary amount of time. And we wanted to take a few minutes and provide the board the latest high level in terms of where we are at. So you get a sense of, of, of what we're asking you to do with this resolution. So uh, John, if you wouldn't mind, uh, jumping in here i appreciate it thank you sure thank you dr Slot. there's you know been a lot of work that's been uh going on the, this past month uh across the department and and so definitely appreciate the comments this evening recognizing the hard work from the the teaching learning and technology team um a lot of people have been putting in a lot of uh, long hours uh you know to navigate really uncharted waters and so um tonight what i want to do is share a little bit uh about our phase three uh, as we roll into that learning plan, but also share with you some guidance that uh, we'll be providing regarding grading practices. So um, let me get this up for you to see. So again, this evening we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, our distance learning plan, but then specifically around guiding guidance on our grading practices and, and the associated board policies. So the, the executive order, um, spoke very specifically to uh, decisions regarding the awarding of credit. And this was the statement in the executive order that that issuance of grades and the use of pass or fail designations we made at the district level by districts with due recognition of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so that's the actual language in the executive order, giving broad discretion to districts to really uh, make the determination on what makes sense uh, in terms of credit and, and grades for students. So 
just highlighting some of our thinking and, and where we're coming from as a district as we have these conversations. The first is do no harm. Um, we really recognize that many of our students and families may be uh, in situations where they may not have access to other technology or to learning. Um, they may be dealing with health uh, concerns of, of members of their immediate family or extended family. So compassion over compliance, our first and foremost uh, concern is for the health and safety of, of our staff and students. Um, but we also know that where we can provide technology and what we can do to help students uh, access uh, content over these uh, these weeks of shutdown, we, we want to do that. We want to meet the needs of all families, respecting uh, that that change from school to home environment is different for different families. Um, someone was sharing earlier today that we had a, uh, we were in a conference call and a student was accessing a, a lesson and and the person's spouse was also on a conference call with, with their work. So uh, families are juggling a lot going on at home uh, in this environment. And so we wanna provide some flexibility to that uh, and choice for students. So uh, that may be uh, engaging in, in video conferences. It may be uh, engaging through email or, or different formats for different students. So we need to be able to meet the needs of, of different families. We also have a short-term and, and a long-term plan. So as we're talking about right now in, in the next nine weeks of school, what, what learning will look like, we, really, we recognize this will have an impact as we return in the fall for the 2021 school year and potentially beyond. So just a quick high level uh, for our phase three learning plan. Uh, it started today and it will continue through uh, the week of June 8th uh, when we are scheduled to be out uh, for the year. Um, our PLC teams, our professional learning communities will be meeting weekly. That's a process we spent a lot of time this fall as the board knows uh, training staff with professional learning communities and that work we're really leaning on that work now uh, and our teachers have just jumped into uh, supporting each other and collaborating with each other and and we heard that from from trisha's comments earlier uh, those teams are determining essential learning so what are the uh, essential learning outcomes that are planned between now and, and the end of the the school year in june all right we've asked our building administrators to be kind of the conduit uh, to assemble all of that information and, and create those weekly communication learning goals for students and families, really so, so families have one stop shop uh, on how to get that information, kind of coordinate their week, plan their week out, again, with, with um, a number of students in the family and, and limited access to technology, we want to make that as easy as possible for families. We've provided scheduled office hours for our teachers and we've staggered that, so our elementary, our middle school, and our high school have office hours at different times through the week to provide uh, support for students uh, and, and help them and be available to them as they progress through these nine weeks of distance learning. Uh, we have talked about how uh, that work uh, will be documented and be reported, and so the next few slides really break that down uh, by level. So starting with our elementary, um, all students will receive a, a remark or what's called an R, uh, on the on the report card for each of the line items that would normally be uh, covered during this last uh, trimester, we have three three report card periods in the elementary. So, um, and we'd really be want we want to track students' participation in that remote learning. So, as we start school in the fall and we get into next year, uh, we really have a a sense of who's been able to engage, who's been who's had access to the content and been able to to work through the essential learnings that we've established within each PLC. Uh, and who do we need to really focus on and, and ensure that there's additional supports to catch them up if they were not able to participate. Um, our elective teachers or our specials teachers will, all, will also be uh, providing uh, information or, or those uh, uh, participation comments for students as we go through. Keep in mind our, our specials teachers at the elementary, they see typically all the students in the building. Uh, so uh, really a, a monumental task for them to make sure that they can reach out virtually uh, to, to hundreds of students uh, each week. At the middle school, it looks a little bit different. We'll be looking at um, continuing with the G mark, which is credit uh, or incomplete, uh, an I uh, for semester two. And again, really uh, keeping track of students' engagement and activity level uh, within each of the essential learnings as we go through the remainder of the school year and, and reporting for term four and a, and a final semester grade. So as a part of the G though, we really want to uh, comment uh, with students that are participating actively in the learning or those that were minimally participating. And again, perhaps they had other issues or other reasons why they weren't able to participate. 
And for those students that, that are not able to touch base with teachers, um, we would be indicating an incomplete or an I on the report card uh, for the remainder of the year. And you'll see the footnote at the bottom here. It, it indicates that this would not apply to those, those courses that students may be taking uh, in the middle school for high school credit. So examples would be uh, algebra or Spanish, some of those other courses where students can earn high school credit at the middle school. Uh, they, would, they would have uh, a little bit different uh, grading structure or reporting structure uh, we'll cover here on the next page. So for the high schools, high school students will have a few more options. Um, the first one here is a letter grade. Uh, so students in our high school that are in uh, credit courses will have the opportunity to earn a letter grade uh, for their coursework. Uh, it will be a combination of the grade that they've earned uh, during term three, so between the end of January and up to March 12th when schools were closed, uh, along with an optional exam or portfolio or culminating activity that they'll be doing uh, at the end of the year. So students who complete that uh, participate in the work and uh, over the next nine weeks and then uh, participate in that optional exam or portfolio uh, will have the opportunity for a letter grade on their, their report card. Uh, those students that continue to participate with uh, teachers uh, over the next nine weeks will have an option for a G or credit uh, for earning credit for those courses. Again, those students who are not participating or not able to uh, engage with the essential learning identified uh, will have an, an incomplete or an I marked for semester two, and they'll have several options for uh, making up that incomplete work in the future. And that could be through summer school, it could be through some additional work next fall, uh, either through a zero hour or a seventh hour. We're talking a lot of, about a lot of different options that students would have for gaining credit for those courses that uh, are incomplete. For those students that don't make up that work, however, uh, by the end of next school year, June of 2021, those incomplete marks would be converted into H's, which is a no credit uh, on the report card. So this is where we're headed in terms of, of credit, no credit, and, and awarding of grades uh, across all levels, elementary, middle, and high school. And then really what, what's the impact in terms of door, board policy? Uh, Dr. Salah mentioned board policies 5127, 5127, 5128, both speak to graduation requirements for our general education and special education students. Um, and then also board policy 6175 was around our uh, technology use policy and, and we've updated our administrative procedures uh, there for um, uh, video conferencing. So that I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Slaw. Thank you, John. Uh, Tom, I'll turn it back to you. Any questions? I'd like to turn it over to uh, our chairperson of TLT. If you have any uh, comments that you'd like to make. Um, just that I think uh, it's a pretty thorough job. I just, you know, want to make sure that our, our graduating seniors understand where they stand credit wise, because it's pretty important for them, you know, uh, to make sure they know that they have will receive enough credits to graduate. And if this uh, last card marking um, or the semester grade, if they're in danger of not getting credit, that they're certainly notified of that. You know, this is a whole different way for us to learn when we're not in, in school every day. So I don't want that to get lost. Um, other than that, I know there might be some little kinks in the, you know, in some of this that'll be get that will get ironed out, you know, what, what a portfolios look like as opposed to exams and so forth. But um, it sounds like a sound plan and I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. I do know that um, we have a resolution uh, before us. Before we get to that, does any other board members have any questions as it relates to uh, this to Dr. Salah or Mr. Tavernier? Yes, Mr. Carlson. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, thank uh, Superintendent Salah and uh, John and the TLT team for uh, the quick turnaround on this. I know we had a conversation, um, I think it was a week ago Friday on this. Uh, they rolled up their sleeves, went right to work. Um, of course, this was right on the heels of the governor's executive order to uh, taking out uh, school for the rest of the year. Um, but I think uh, what this plan does is it, it provides a multitude 
of options uh, for our students and our families in regards to doing a uh, pass fail or, or kind of credit. Uh, but it also provides an opportunity uh, for some of our, our students as it relates to high school um, uh, to earn a letter grade as well. Uh, which I think is uh, really important for those that are, are freshmen, sophomores, and juniors. Um, I think most of the grades are locked in for, for seniors. Of course, we still need them to, to participate. The other thing that I think is, is good about this um, from a policy perspective is, um, uh, you know, it accounts for hopefully we're not in this situation in the fall or next spring, uh, but I think it's a good plan that could be uh, reintroduced if, if in fact we find ourselves in the same in the same situation. So um, uh, I just want to say thank you uh, for the flexibility and rolling up the sleeves to come up with a great solution. Thank you. Uh, I do have one couple questions, uh, John, on the presentation. I'm making the assumption that this is a, a work in progress still because uh, obviously there's some specific challenges that we have as it pertains to communicating to our seniors and what those requirements are and what's been outlined as it relates to what their responsibilities. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So a lot of detail uh, needs to be added to this. We are working as a on a uh, frequently asked questions document and some policies and uh, protocols that we will have recommendations for teachers and how they can use that in, in in communicating that with families on what options they have going forward. So that's still in development, but we hope to uh, roll this all out, get this communicated as soon as possible so that uh, students and families and our teachers uh, know what the target is uh, as we look forward for the next nine weeks. So, so as a board member, I'll, I'll be looking you'll be pre presenting to us some additional information as it relates to the ex expectations specifically 9 through 11 and then another matrix as it relates to if I'm a senior what's expected of me to to get a grade or to graduate and and move forward with that that dovetails into the executive order as it relates to a high school senior yes exactly okay so you'll keep us posted on that as as mm -hmm. you continue having conversations with our teacher leaders and in your staff to come up with that final communication document. Great, thank you. Um, we do have a resolution in, in front of us. Um, I think it would be appropriate at this point in time to possibly read that resolution prior to us taking a motion and, and discussing it. Uh, Mr. Carlson, are you prepared to, to go over that resolution? Yes. Uh Thank you for uh, tolerating my back and forth with another uh, public meeting tonight. So thank you for that. Um, so here on Valley Board of Education resolution regarding the executive order 2020-35, April 13th, uh, 2020. Whereas the state of Michigan, Governor Gretchen Whitmer declared a state of emergency issuing executive order 2020-4 on March 10th, 2020, due to the first two presumptive cases of COVID-19. Whereas Governor Whitmer took additional action to issue executive order 2000 or 2020-5, closing schools from March 16th, 2020 uh, through April 5th, 2020, in an effort to mitigate the spread of uh, the coronavirus. Um, whereas Governor uh, Action uh, took further action to ex uh, issue Executive Order 2020-35 on April 2nd, 2020, whereas Executive Order 2020-35 suspends in-person K-12 through education for the remainder of the 2019-2020 school year and requires a variety of actions associated with learning at home. Uh, grading practices and graduation requirements. Whereas Huron Valley Schools Board of Policy 5127 and 5128 require certain requirements associated with pupil credits and graduation requirements. Whereas the Huron Valley School understands the extenuating circumstances associated with the COVID pandemic. Whereas the Huron Valley School believes in a collaborative process to decision making, including multiple stakeholders committed to supporting the best interests of students and families. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the Huron Valley Schools Board of Education waives policy requirements associated with the graduation to the extent permitted by the governor's executive order. 
Let it further be resolved that the Board of Education gives authority to the Huron Valley Schools Superintendent to develop and implement plans in accordance with district processes for communicating, collaborating, and implementing solutions that comply with Executive Order 2020-35. Thank you very much. Do I have a motion to accept this resolution? So moved. Do I have a Four. second? Motion made by uh, Member Car Treasurer Carlson, supported by Member Long. Can I have a roll call, please? You may, Mr. Carlson. Yes. Mr. Long. Yes. A Mr. Pearson. Yes. I am a yes. Uh, where are we? Ms. Pistano. Yes. Uh, Ms. Cotter. Yes. All right. Mr. Wiseman. Yes. Motion for the resolution carries. Mr. Wiseman, point of order. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I'd like to record a uh, favorability vote for the consent agenda as well. Will I add you? Yes. Okay, got oh, it. Lord. You got. You have it, Secretary Forrest? I sure do. Thank you very much. Uh, next item under new business, emergency Chromebook purchase. Um, do I have a motion to approve this? I'll make that motion to approve. Okay. Do I have a second? Support. Okay. Motion made by Secretary Forrest, seconded by Member Long. Any discussion? Uh, Dr. Salah or Jeffrey, um, it, it says emergency Chromebook purchase. Could you give us a little bit more detail on that? what that purchase is sure <clears throat> why it was an emergency so, so <laughs> well as what we learned through our surveying of students was that 81 of our families not only uh, lack access to chromebooks or technology but they also lack connectivity uh, therefore uh, they would have no means of engaging in phase three of our continuity of learning plan um, we deemed it as an emergency given the uh, pandemic situation uh, and an inability to deliver any sort of opportunities for educational uh, learning uh, given the, the current confines. Uh, we did contact legal counsel. They did feel that this fell under uh, the status of, of emergency and, and therefore on April 7th, I uh, communicated with the, with the entire Board of Education regarding our intent to move forward with the purchase of 100 Chromebooks, including 800 gigabytes of, of pool data. Uh, the, the dollar amount was $51,533.17. Uh, the, the company, Kajit, had uh, 150 units uh, in stock. As of the uh, composition of my email to you uh, on April 7th at 2.36, uh, PM and and within 30 minutes, uh, 60 of them uh, had been had been purchased. Uh, so we needed to take prompt action in order to ensure that our students had an opportunity uh, to continue learning. Thank you very much. Could we have a roll call, please? Yes, I'll turn my microphone on. Um, I support the motion, Mr. Long. Uh, yes. Uh, point of clarification. Yes. Uh, this is a motion to ratify the purchase. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We'll continue. Mr. Pearson. Yes. Ms. Pastana. Yes. Ms. Cotter. Yes. And Mr. Wiseman. Yes. All right. Motion carries. Public comments, agenda, non-agenda items in accordance with board policy. Mr. Trevernier, do we have any public comments? No public comments tonight. Thank you very much. Good and welfare. Anyone have any anything they would like to share or ask during good and welfare? Yes, Mrs. Forrest. Yes, I have something fun coming up that I'd like to let our community know about. Uh, as a uh, board member on here on Valley Council for the Arts, we had a really fabulous art show that was scheduled to go public uh, 
up in Highland at HBCA on the 3rd, but um, of course uh, that was canceled along with most other outings. But we uh, still are going forward with our climate change art show, and that's going to be virtual, going uh, live, Facebook Live this Friday. Uh, April 17th from 1 o'clock to 3 o'clock in the art show uh, is about 30 adult artists showing their work. You can click on their th thumbnail of their work and get a little explanation of it. And we have a, about 30 uh, students who uh, are exhibiting and there's a couple from uh, here in Valley School District. So uh, check that out. And there's going to be three um, artists that are going uh, Facebook Live, they will be talking about their art and where they get their inspiration from. And they're also going to do, oh, maybe about a 20 minute lesson for kids. And so our, our uh, school kids, our artists in the district might want to tune in. We have um, a painter, a photographer, and I believe a printmaker. And so they're going to be, it's going to be about a two hour period uh, from one to three o'clock. So hopefully folks will turn, tune in. It's going to be a Zoom meeting and you can uh, find the links on uh, oh, hvca.org uh, here in Valley Council for the Arts on their website. So hopefully um, some of our uh, board members and uh, uh, folks in the district will tune in. So again, that's this Friday on the 17th from 1 to 3. Go on to Huron Valley Council for the Arts on their website and you can get that Zoom link that we're all getting so familiar with. So um, that's what I have. Should be something fun. Thanks. Thank you. Ms. Stana. Ms. Forrest, I'd like to know, is there any pictures of pineapples on your HVCA? Pineapples. Pineapples. Looking for pineapples. Are you looking for pineapples? We may find some. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. I will attend. Thank so, you. So tune in. There's quite a large variety of um, art and some really exemplary, uh, exemplary works of art. So you will be pleasantly supply, supply, surprised. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Anything else? A um, couple of, uh, number one, I want to uh, uh, send out our appreciation to our board rep, uh, Ms. Cotter, as it relates to our uh, blessings in the backpack, and the work that's being done in conjunction with uh, all the work that the district is doing, how much uh, we appreciate that and, and your representative representation. How many, how many uh, backpacks are we doing on a weekly basis, Lindsay? Oh. Turn on your mic. Oh, there we go. I also have to extend a thank you to uh, Denise Pistana. She's been assisting me in distributing uh, the backpack packages to uh, some of our sites. Um, we are distributing 19 boxes a week, and each box has 30 uh, weekend bags of food in them. So that's kind of what we've been going through and we've got it all each site gets a certain number of boxes but with Denise's help and we have a our, our we have a coordinator named Patrick who actually he's not a Huron Valley parent but this man has come out of the community to work with us and so we're di we're distributing 19 boxes um, there's 30 bags in each box so that's what we've been doing. We're, we've been delivering on Thursday nights now or Thursday afternoon for the Saturday morning. And some of them get distributed on Friday, but just a shout out to them. However, unlike uh, our food service department that's going to keep going with this, um, we're probably only going to be able to go another four or five weeks and then, and then our, uh, our food supply will be depleted. But then we'll look forward to another fundraiser and get back on our feet and start off in September again. So I just want to thank those people who have been so supportive. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Denise, for your, your assistance in that. Uh, the other thing that the other item and maybe uh, Paul or uh, Paul, you can help us with with this new uh, uh, the new world that we're living in. We have. Last, last board meeting, we had a resolution. This one, we have a resolution that normally would require signatures. Um, how are we handling that? We had the, uh, as it relates to the terms, that was uh, the resolution to change the six-year terms. 
and then tonight's resolution. How 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 are we managing that to get get both of those? I think tonight's resolution, because it really is just something we file internally, um, and we may be required at some point to to send it to the Michigan Department of Education for for record purpose uh, uh, for record keeping pur purposes. We could probably handle that uh, electronically either. Uh, by board members uh, signing, scanning, and sending that to to uh, Lori, or uh, you know, sending an electronic signature uh, to Lori Hill, uh, where she can populate your signatures on a PDF and then filing that. Uh, in terms of the the last resolution related to board terms, uh, I, I would need to uh, ask Jeffrey and or Sandy Elka. Uh, for clarification re regarding whether we need original signatures uh, for filing I'm that. Fair, hey, Superintendent Salah, yeah. I'm fairly yeah. certain that you're going to need signatures on that one. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you're right, Sean. Um, yeah, so so we will need to uh, we will need to formalize that process and get those signatures somehow. Whether that's uh, asking uh, board members to. Uh, come up to the board member, or I'm sorry, come up to the uh, administrative offices, uh, practicing social distancing and, and signing the document, or or us actually uh, driving it to individual homes of board members and collecting those signatures. But we will need to get that uh, rectified, really, sometime this week. And, and Sean, how how what's going on over at the county for us to deliver this? Because isn't isn't timing of the essence at this point in time? Maybe you can give us some uh, time, timing is uh, Timing is important, um, but I, I do think that we need to get the, the signatures. Do we have DocuSign as, as a program? Does John know that? Is he online? Yeah, we do not have DocuSign. It, it, is that fairly expensive? You know, I don't know the answer to that question. We we could investigate that. Because DocuSign would make it uh, really, really simple just to click. I don't know if everybody's got something at home. Otherwise, uh, Tom, my recommendation would be is is that yes, board members give them a time slots to come up to the to the office um, as best they can to uh, uh, to have that at the front desk or whatever and, and sign it and try to get it done by uh, uh, Wednesday, close of business. Because it needs to be delivered to the Bureau of Elections by ASAP, right? I, I think so. I don't have the exact date, but I, I, I wouldn't want to waste any more time. Okay. And are they, are they open or how do, how, how would it be? Delivered? Uh, they, they, they are, we can, we can file that. Um, I did put in a question uh, and I haven't heard back from him. Uh, the elections uh, division chair there. I'm drawing a blank on his name right now. Um, uh, but uh, um, I'll talk to Lisa Brown um, uh, as well, just to, to get this handled. I'll, I'll give her a call tomorrow specifically. Appreciate it. Thank you. And then Paul, you'll coordinate. As the rest of us have heard, it's it's important for us to get our signatures so that we can move this. So if, if at all possible, if we can get this done by Wednesday, so we can get it up to the county. It'd be appreciated. Yeah, I think the filing deadline is April twenty first, so Wednesday would give us time to run it over there. Yeah, you'll you'll have a communication tomorrow. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. Anything else? With that, board meet board meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.